Okay, welcome to chapter four on federalism uh, video lecture. Um, for this chapter, the big idea is under the U.S. federal system of government, both the national government and state governments have certain powers. So federalism, which is defined as um, division of power between uh, the national and state governments, this is the big idea that we're going to look at what those powers are that the national government has and what powers do the state governments have. Um, if you also remember from our previous um, chapters we covered, uh, we talked about how the United States, one principle behind the United States is federalism, and the system of government that, that has been created in the United States is a federal system of government where the power is divided between our national and our state governments. Um, but this wasn't always the case. Again, under the Articles of Confederation, we were a confederate, uh, we had a confederate system of government. Um, but since we scratched that and started again, wrote the Constitution, we have a federal system of government. We've had that for 200 plus years. So, um, yeah, so this is chapter four, federalism. Uh, the central questions for this chapter are uh, how are powers and responsibilities divided between the national and state governments? How has American federalism evolved over the course of our history? And how is the balance of power between the states and national government characterized today? So, by the end of this, chapter, you should be able to answer these three essential questions. So let's start with uh, the first essential question here. How are powers and responsibilities divided between the national and state governments? All right, so our national government, um, they have their own powers. Again, federalism, division of power between the national and state government. Um, and the Constitution gives the national government three types of powers. Uh, the first one being an express power. These are ones that are actually stated in the Constitution. If you go to, um, if you look up the Constitution and look at them, you can see the powers that are given specifically to um, each branch of government, and those are called express powers because they're expressly written in the Constitution itself. The second type of power that's granted to the national government is what's called implied powers. Um, now, implied powers are powers that they have because they somehow relate to one of the enumerated or expressed powers. Enumerated just is is another another word for expressed. I mean, it's in the Constitution itself. Um, let's see. Um, Imply powers. They're not specifically in the Constitution, but they're um, they're an extension. Another way of saying, it, or so another way of saying, it is they're an extension of from what you would see actually in the um, Constitution itself. An, ex an example. In this minute here, I'm going to show you. Um, some examples of that. And then the last type is powers, inher inherited powers. Ones that are not specifically spelt out in the Constitution, but um, throughout time and um, throughout our history just have become part of the government's responsibility. Um, for instance, uh, the power to acquire new territory. There's nowhere in the Constitution that talks about that, but like um, when it comes to like uh, when we bought the the Louisiana Purchase. Um, there was no that was there was no precedent dump before that um, when it comes to buying new territory. Um, that worked out for us pretty well. We got a lot of good land. And they had a lot of resources in it. So that's an example of of an inherent power. It's nowhere in the Constitution, but historically the government has taken on that power um, when it comes to buying land, as an example. So those are three types of powers that the national government has expressed, implied, and inherited powers. Um, now, all three of these collectively together, they were called, it's called what the, it's what's called delegated powers. Powers are given to the government by the Constitution, either expressed, implied, and inherited. So all three of them combined, delegated powers. But separately, the powers are expressed, implied, and inherited powers. Now, these 18 powers listed right here are an example of expressed powers in the Constitution. This is from Article 1 of the Constitution. These are expressed powers given to um, Congress, specifically Congress. And um, they're also enumerated. Again, they're numbered 1 through 18, um, meaning they're numbered. So expressed enumerated powers for Congress are right here, Article 1 of the Constitution. And the last clause, or last power here, is called the Elastic Clause, which is where you get implied powers. Um, the elastic clause basically says that um, 
Congress has a power to make laws that connect or help them carry out any of these expressed powers above 1 through 17. So we're going to look at a case here, for example, McCulloch versus Maryland. Um, when it comes to um, regulating commerce or, or coining money, the banks. We're going to talk. We're going to talk about a uh, case when it comes with banks dealing with the banks. So, um, nowhere, nowhere in here does it say that the Constitution or does the Congress have the power to create a bank. But if you look at that elastic clause, it would say they'd have the power to carry out any of these laws. So they may. So maybe the they have the power to create a national bank because of regulating commerce or coining money that will help them do those or accomplish those um, those to follow through on those powers that they have. By creating a bank. Another example is the healthcare. More modern example is the healthcare. Nowhere in here will you see um, do you see a, a a power given to Congress to create a national healthcare provided so healthcare provided by the national government to every and all people, American citizens. However, the elastic clause would say in order for the government to carry out commerce, to regulating commerce, making sure everybody is fair. Um, fair and equal chance of buying health insurance, um, they have the power to pass a law like that. So an elastic clause, as again, is an applied power that is stated in the Constitution itself. All right, so that's the national government's power. Now, the states has their own power as well. Again, federalism is division of power between national and state governments. So reserve powers are powers that are given, direct, are given directly to the states themselves. They're reserved only for the states. So these are um, the powers uh, of the states. One is regulating intrastate commerce. So it's, it's key to understand what an interstate and intrastate means, the difference. Interstate, e with a E instead of A, um, that means dealing with trading or buying and selling things of goods that go across state line. Intrastate is a buying and selling of goods within your own state. So States have the power to regulate trade and buying and, and so forth of goods within their own state. Um, like something going, so you're buying or selling something from Clark County to Washoe County. Um, those are, you're crossing intrastate lines, not interstate lines. So there's a difference between intra and interstate. So regulating that, um, they have the power to establish local government systems. An example here I have in parentheses is state courts. They have the power to create um, Establish these state courts, and also not just courts, but also local governments. Nowhere in the Constitution does it talk about local governments, and um, the states have the power to create a city or create a county, um, divide up the counties um, however they feel fit. So establishing local government systems within the state itself, they all have the power to do that. That's their own power. Um, three, administer elections. Um, <clears throat> So when it comes to election day, especially even if it's national, if it, even if it's a national election, like for presidency, that's all done by the state. The state is the ones that comes up with the the voting system, um, how it's going to be done. Uh, if you may not know, but like Oregon, for instance, their state they vote only by um, a mail-in ballot. That's the only way they vote. They don't go to voting booths um, and click on a screen or something like that. Everyone in the state votes by mailing in their ballot. Um, where here in Nevada, we have an electronic voting system. It's um, a computerized system where you just go to a, a voting booth and you 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 hit the you hit your you touch the screen and you select who you want to vote. So every state is different in how they administer the election, and that's again a reserve power for the state, so that they're not all the same. And also when it comes to drawing the district lines, um, like what districts is congressional district one, two, and three. Uh, where those lines are drawn, that's all decided by the state. In Nevada, we just recently redrew our electric district lines because of our because of the census. We have a bigger population. We were able to add a a, a district uh, house representative seat, and so instead of three, we have four house representative seats um, from Nevada. And Nevada just recently drew those those state lines. So again, administrative election. That's another power given to them. Fourth power is um, protecting the public and one way they do that is having a, um, a, a state militia or national guard we don't call them militias anymore they're national guards every state has their own national guard and 
the governor is in charge of them. Um, he can move them around to, you know, if a disaster, natural disaster is taking place to help um, take care of that or rioting. Um, so use the National Guard to protect the public from those type of instances. And uh, fifth one, they have the power to tax. Um, some states have a state income tax, some don't, Nevada does not, but there's sales taxes and they're all different in different counties. Um, different counties in Nevada have different sales tax. So um, that's all regulated by the states themselves. And then um, six one here is to ratify amendments to the Constitution. So whenever there is a proposal to change or add to the Constitution, um, the states have the power to ratify them. Um, there's a certain number of states that have to do that, three fourths. But anyways, states have to uh, have the right have the right to ratify an amendment or not. <clears throat> so those are the reserved powers of states. They also have powers that they both share, and these are called concurrent powers. Um, so expressed, implied, and inherited powers are all given. These are all delegated powers to the national government. Reserved powers are all powers given to the states. And concurrent powers are powers that they both, national and state governments, share. And um, one concurrent power they both share is taxes. So there is, there's definitely, everyone pays a national federal income tax, um, no matter where you live. However, some states don't have a state income tax, but every state does have sales tax. So they both tax some way or some way, somehow. Um, so taxes is a shared power. Borrowing money is another shared power. Um, Believe it or not, our governments borrow money to help build things and provide services to the public, and um, both can do that. The national government borrows money from states, and they also borrow from other countries, and same with the states. They can borrow money from other other states uh, as well. Um, third power that they share is spending, spend for general welfare. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more um, in this chapter here, but um, basically when it comes to like social services, um, either the national government or the state state governments help provide for like um, unemployment or housing, um, health care, stuff like that. Um, so general welfare, they they both help pay for that. And then lastly, what a power they both do is they enact and enforce laws. So we have national laws that, that are passed. And then you have state laws that are passed, and both of these laws are either going to be enforced by national government or by the state government. And um, it's something they both share in doing, passing and enforcing laws. All right, so how does the Constitution regulate interstate relationships? So how does, basically, is the question is, um, what does the Constitution say about how states relate with each other? And um, if you want to really know, um, what the Constitution says, you can find it in Article 4 uh, of the Constitution itself. So, we're going to go over a couple of the requirements um, that the Constitution uh, requires the states, and basically to try to help the states behave with each other. Um, so the first thing that the Article 4 talks about is called full faith and credit, um, which says each state must recognize the laws of each other. So, basically, let's see if I have something else here, no. So each state must recognize the laws of each other. Um, when a uh, if any public act or official record or judicial pro judicial proceedings um, take place in one state, um, every other state must recognize um, those um, records or um, official um, acts as well. Um, so if I sign a contract in one state, it's recognized in another state. Um, my driver's license, it's recognized in another state. They're not. I'm not going to be told to go back to my state because I don't have a, their state license. Or um, ma being married, um, being married. I'm sorry. Um, if I'm married, if I'm married and I move to another state, it's still recognized in that state as well. Um, so that's what full faith and credit clause mean. This is just this was intended to make sure that you're not going to be discriminated or not discriminated against. That's what the next one is. But um, basically help people to try you basically helps you move around the, the state the country much easier without having to um, um, maybe pass a bunch of tests or go through um, the more government loops um, hoops just to um, to live or um, change addresses so recognizing other state laws is a good thing which allows 
which it, which also helps us to move around our country as well freely more freely. Um, the second um, regulation in the Constitution you can find in Article Four is called privileges and immunities, um, and this is when it comes to discrimination. It basically says that states can't discriminate against other citizens from other states. So just because I'm from Nevada and I go to California, I'm not going to be discriminated from that. And you got to remember when the Constitution was written, um, there was a, a lot of people had, people had a lot more pride where they were from and where they came from. And um, there was more, I would say, rivalry between states than compared to today. Um, today, most people just, you know, if you're American, you're American. They don't really care where you come from. But um, back then, back in the early years of our, of our nation, um, it was a big, it was, it meant more to people from wh where they are from. And you may or may not be discriminated, you probably would be discriminated against more so than, than you are um, today. Um, so, privilege and immunities, um, some examples here, if you're, um, you know, you're living in one, you live in one state and you visit or go to another state, you're, you're going to be paying the same um, sales tax. You're not going to be, um, you know, make you're not going to have you're going to be told to pay more money because you're from out of state you don't or you don't live there so um, that's an example um, however there are some um, some things that don't apply to the privilege community and this is when it comes to voting um, I can't vote in my state that I'm from and then go to another state and vote so privilege community I'm not they're not going to discriminate against me for doing that serving on a jury you can only be certain you know the jury is supposed to be people of your peers, which means you live in that area, and I'm not going to be, I can't be discriminated because I'm not on a jury in another state. And use of public, certain public facilities, this is, um, a good example of this is um, public colleges. You know, you may or may not have to pay higher, you may have to pay a higher rate in tuition because you're not from the state of that state college. And um, so that's not, that wouldn't go against privileges and immunity discriminate against, because that wouldn't be unreasonable. Uh, state college is intended for people from that state to go to. So if you go to an out of state, um, it does not go against the Constitution by them making by them charging you more. It doesn't go against the Constitution. And the third um, regulation on states is called extraditing or ext to extradite, which means to return. And um, usually, when a fugitive commits a crime and they flee to another state. It's the responsibility of the governor to make sure that they return to that state where the crime was committed, so that that state can um, prosecute them and um, you know have them put them in jail for the crime they committed in their state. So that's the third um, regulation that you can find in the Constitution and under Article Four. Um, that's how to help keep states civil and um, um, working with each other and not bickering and fighting all the time. All right, so the essential question from this section um, you should be able to answer is how are powers and responsibilities divided between national and state governments? Okay, so section two of um, chapter four's federalism is American federalism, conflict and change. And the essential question for this section is how has American federalism evolved over our history, over time? So federalism... Um, isn't hasn't always been the same when it comes to who has more power or say either national or or state government um, and that's what we're going to look at there during this section here is how has it changed over time um, now the way the reason it's changed is mainly because of the Supreme Court the Supreme Court by acting as a referee they either give the national government or the state government more power on whatever that um, policy area may be so you have national laws that get passed, you have state laws that get passed, and ultimately some of these laws are going to make their way up to the Supreme Court, which is also the Supreme Law, Supreme Court, and they make the final decision. They are the ones that interpret what the Constitution means. And depending on how they, they rule on a particular case, is going to determine who has more power. So that's why they act as referees. And early on in our history, um, I would say even for most of our history, the national government or the Supreme Court has always given more power to the national government, and the reason being is Article Six of the Constitution, which is the supremacy, um, which is where you find the supremacy clause that states that all that the Constitution and, and national laws are the supreme law of the land, and because of that, they tend to and have for most of the most of the time um, given more power to the national 
government rather than the states. And um, so they have a huge role when it comes to um, this uh, division of power between state and national governments. All right, so early on in our uh, history in America, from 1789 to 1930s, is, we, is what this era we call dual federalism. And dual federalism is this um, idea that uh, the federal, the national government and state governments are equal, have equal authorities over their particular areas of influence. So when we talked about reserved powers and uh, the delegated powers of the national government, um, during this time, if, it, if whatever the, the policy was, if it dealt in their realm, the states had, um, had basically equal rights compared to the national government. So they're on equal ground within their realm of course, of powers that they were given to them by the Constitution itself. Um, so they're seen as equals, and this is also the beginning of political parties developing in our nation very early on, from the very beginning of our, our, beginning of our, our nation here. Um, you have people who are nationalists, who um, believe in a strong centralized government, and this includes Washington and Alexander Hamilton, and then you have um, state rights people like Thomas Jefferson who think that the good national government should not um, basically run amok over states and the states should have a lot more say compared to national governments um, as well. Uh, They're fearful of, of the nation, national government dictating too much to what the states have to do. So this is the early on beginnings of our political parties um, in our nation as well because there's no mention of political parties in our constitution also. Um, and this is especially true, or this whole idea of um, who should have more power um, within their own realms is uh, in the case McCulloch versus Maryland. In this case, the ruling by um, Chief Justice Marshall, um, it increased the power of the federal government over the states. And um, just some background on this case here is um, in the early on in the 1700s, or almost 1800s, Congress passed a law that established a, a national bank, the first bank in the United States. And um, at the time when this was passed, a lot of people didn't know if they actually had the right to do so. Um, but again, this kind of goes to one of the implied powers. Um, the Elastic Clause of the Constitution says they have the, um, they have the power to regulate commerce or coin money. And the, in order to do that, they felt like they needed to have a national bank. Um, and so... Um, let's see here. So, as a result, Congress um, passed this national bank, and um, the states opposed the national banks. They didn't think they had the right to do so, and because of that, some states started to create their own state banks. And particularly, this case is about the state bank of Maryland. Um, they passed a law that says they can tax all banks operating within their borders. And since there was a national bank within the borders of Maryland. Um, they taxed the the national government's bank. Um, uh, let's see, and then the so Maryland passes has a law to pass pass a law to tax all banks within their their boundaries. Um, when the national bank that was in Maryland refused to pay the tax, the state of Maryland sued the national bank, their cashier James McCulloch. Um, and that's why he's in the suit. The name of the suit. Uh, the legal battle went to the Supreme Court. And Chief Justice Marshall had two questions he had to resolve. First one was whether or not the Constitution gives Congress the power to establish a national bank. So do they even, if you look at the Constitution, do they even have the right to do so in the first place to have this national bank? And secondly, whether or not the Constitution gives states the power to tax a national bank. So these are the two um, questions that Marshall had to answer. And ultimately what happened was um, Marshall ruled in favor of uh, McCulloch, who were representing the national government. Um, uh, let's see here. Marshall, the Chief Justice, Marshall was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He argued that the bank's charter was justified by the Constitution's necessary and proper clause, which gives Congress the power to take actions necessary to properly carry out their express powers. Um, so in this case, he concluded that it was responsible for the nation to exercise an implied power the started bank since it ha would help the nation properly execute its powers to regulate commerce and currency. So basically, Marshall looked at the Constitution and said they have an, um, 
an implied power due to the necessary and proper clause or the elastic clause that says they need to carry out these, um, they have the power to carry out commerce and coining of money, so therefore they have the right to to um, to create that bank. And then when it comes to the second question, Marshall argued that Maryland could not tax a bank because the power to tax involves the power to destroy, and if a state could tax a national institution or a national bank, then they can weaken or destroy it, um, which would go against the supremacy clause of the Constitution. Um, and that was his reason and for ruling against the states of Maryland in that case, and that on that question alone. So, McCulloch versus Maryland ultimately increased the power of the federal government um, when it comes to regulating commerce and coining of money. I mean, they say basically say they have the right to to create a bank, a national bank. All right, another example um, or another event that took place during this time period was the Civil War that expanded the national government's powers. Um, let me go back. Um, because after the after the Civil War was took was over and done with, um, Congress passed Reconstruction Amendments, which is the um, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, Amendments to the Constitution. And um, these amendments abolish slavery. They define what citizenship means. Like, what does it mean to be a citizen of the United States? And then they prohibit states from denying citizens rights and extending voting rights to African American men. So, by doing that, they um, they're expanding the national powers, the government's powers, to protect civil rights. But also, they're basically telling the states how they have to conduct business within their states, um, giving them less say or power um, in their within their own states. Um, and even if the states have opposed it, they still had to follow the laws of the of the um, the constitution. So, civil war. Another event during this time period that um, expanded national government's powers. All right, and then up to the 30s through 60s, we have um, an era which was called which is called cooperative fe federalism. And um, what cooperative federalism is is um, is where the the state and national government work together to um, to uh, take care of a crisis, and if you know your timeline in history, 1930s is the beginning, or um, yeah, basically the beginning of the Great Depression, and the Depression again was another is another event that gave more power to the national government um, because the poverty and unemployment became so widespread in America. There was this there was this huge transition in our way of thinking um, about government and how what their role is in America. And because there's so much poverty and unemployment in America, um, you have Roosevelt, who becomes ele who was elected in the presidency. He passed these new programs called, which he called the New Deal, which was going to help help unemployment and um, provide people who were unemployed some money to help them help them out. Um, so, an example this is Social Security, which is which helps people who are unemployed or the elderly. <coughs> and so. This is a major shift in American history because before this time, people didn't look to the national government to help them or bail them out of um, a crisis that th that they were having to go through at the time. Um, that wasn't the case. You didn't, you didn't turn to the government. But after the Great Depression or during the Great Depression, people started looking to the, to the government to um, help help them out. And because of this, you're expanding the power of the national government by doing this. And uh, this is the first time national government took responsibility for social and economic welfare. And again, this is a reason why their power was expanding over states' um, powers. And um, so cooperative federalism, national and state governments working together um, during this era. So basically the government would come up with these programs and um, provide uh, money to the unemployed and so forth. And they would work with the states to um, help these people in need. Um, so that's cooperative federalism, 30s to the 60s. And then from the 60s to the 80s, we have this era called creative federalism, um, which is, is basically uh, creative federalism involves national funds or money in, um, in the form of grants that are going to be given to the states 
to help um, achieve a goal or to help get to eradicate something. And so what, what was going on in the 60s is LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, was president at the time, and he had this program or this idea of wanting to um, eliminate poverty in America, and it's called the Great Society. And um, it, the initiative or the, the aim or the goal of this of the Great Society was to get rid of um, poverty. An example of this is Medicaid. And Medicaid is a program designed to help people who are poor help pay for their health care um, needs that they need that they need provided for them. So Great Society is another example of how the government, national government was able to expand their power when it comes to um, a social issue like poverty. Um, and so what, what they would do, what the national government does, and they still do today, is they release funds or grants, and these this money that's been given to that's going to be given to the states or local government, they come with strings attached to it, meaning basically if you if we give you this money, you have to maybe put it in this area or you have to um, pass a law that um, goes along with something that this national government wants you to pass. So again, the Great Society is an example of how the national government's power grew due to um, trying to eliminate a crisis um, like poverty. Um, and when they're so, and because of this, because of releasing more funds and um, to the state, and last, the state and local government releasing more money, this means the national government has to increase their size by creating more government agencies, and then also um, expanding their budget or their cost of how much they need, how much more money. So they may raise taxes because they need to help pay for these programs. So this is just how they expanded their power by increasing their size and cost. Um, their cost of the national government. All right, and then the 80s to the 2000s um, is what this era is called the New Federalism. And what New Federalism is, is this idea that um, we're going to reverse this trend of expanding the national government's powers and start giving more power to the states. Um, so New Federalism is a reversal of this expansion of power to, to the national government. And this is all um, began, started with uh, Ronald Reagan when he was elected to office. Um, he believed that the national government was late, less effective than the state government. Basically, he thought the national government didn't do a really good job, and he thought that the state governments can do a much better job if um, the national government would just stay out of their hair, basically. So um, what his idea was is to cut national grants or money to the states and... Um, whatever money was given to them, he would basically leave it up to the states to determine what's the best use of that money. So cut government spending that goes to the states and also allow the states, if there's, they, he didn't get rid of all, all the money that goes to states, but the, what money that did go, he would give them more freedom into where that money would go into and how they would use that money. And um, this is called de, uh, Devo, uh, I came to say, Devolu uh, devolution, devolution. Um, this idea again is to uh, returning power to the states, and this is another another example of um, this trend of giving more power to states was when uh, Republicans took control of the House of Rep Representatives, and they had this contract with America which promised to reduce the size of, and power of the national government itself. Um, the downside to this if there is one, is that states would not be able to adequately fund these programs that they now have in place because they're not getting as much money from the federal government. Um, so if the, the risk is if you cut money going to states, that the states are no longer going to be able to help provide maybe the same care that they were in the past, um, or they're going to have to come, they're going to have to do, raise their own taxes to help fund those programs that they have had in place already so that's the risk of taking away that money from the federal governments and giving more power to the states um, is the lack of money coming into the states to help fund these programs so you should now be able to answer this essential question from section two how has American federalism evolved over the course of our nation's history and there's a really good um, chart or timeline on page 105 of this evolution of federalism 
in your book. It's on page 105. That's a good chart to look at to um, be able to answer that question. So the final section of chapter 4, um, section 3 here, federalism today, and the essential question is, how is the balance of power between the states and national government national government characterized today? So in this section, you should be able to answer uh, be, be able to answer this essential question from this section. Okay, so federal government today, um, a, a good way that the, or a good tool that the federal government, and national government uses to try to influence the state governments is called fiscal federalism, meaning fiscal meaning like money, um, using money either by spending, taxing, or providing grants, which are large are large amounts of money. Um, to these to the federal system, they insert into the federal system in order to try to influence the states themselves and take away their power and give more power to the national government. So this this, this fiscal federalism allows the national government to influence state policies in a huge way, and I'm going to show you a couple examples of how they do that. So um, in order for a state to be influenced by the national government is through grants or these large amounts of money that states will are wanting and needing to help provide different public services to their citizens in their state. And even like, and it's, it's so much, it's really true in today's economy, and especially the last three, four years, with the economy being in such shambles as it is, states are not making as much money as they used to. And because of that, when the federal government says, hey, we got some, we have a grant here that will give you a bunch of money to help pay for your education or help pay for um, roads or help pay for um, social services, including unemployment and health care and poor people, um, people on welfare, um, the states are more are going to look at that and, and maybe want to take it because they're not getting as much money as they used to um, because of unemployment, especially here in Nevada. That's, um, that's especially true with having one of the highest unemployment rates. You're not states not making as much money as they used to. So, if the federal government is wanting to provide this grant, um, states are going to look at that and want to take it. Um, but there's a but with this. Often these grants come with a mandate or a an order to have you like have to do it. You have to do certain things in order to receive this money. So it's it's a grant. It's money given to you with strings attached to it. Um, so let's look at these. Um, and, and because of this these mandates, this has a huge influence over states. So one of these, one type of grant that can be issued to the states is called categorical grant. And what a categorical grant does, it allows states to receive money, but the, the money that they're getting, the grant that they're getting, is for a specific purpose. It could be specifically for um, computers in a classroom, or it could be specifically for, specifically for repairing bridges. Um, so it's, it's categorical, meaning it's for a certain area that the federal government determines you must spend the money on. You don't have a lot of, the states don't have a lot of say with where the money's going to go. The, the federal government says, you want this money, you got to put it towards this certain purpose. So the amount of money that state gets is usually based on their population. The larger the state you are, the more money you get, um, compared to smaller states. So Nevada would, would be on the lower end of amounts of money that the state would receive because of our low population here in the state. So category grants are for a specific purpose, purpose, and it's based how much you get is based on your state's population. The other type of grant is a block grant, which is a broader type of grant. Um, the money goes to something very broad and general. So instead of like um, money to give it for computers in a public school, it can just be for public school. And then the states and the school districts, they decide where in the school they'll need that money. Is it to pay for salaries for teachers, or is it to pay for new books, new computers, um, repairing or building new schools? It's kind of up to them. They have more freedom in where the money is going to go. So grants, block grants allow more freedom. States prefer this, you know, which makes sense because they have more freedom to decide where the money is going to go. Um, this is... Um, this is what um, Ronald Reagan was doing in 1980s when he uh, came into office. He was trying to um, reverse the trend of expanding the national government's power and giving more to the state's power. And he started issuing block grants to decrease the size and influence of the national government. 
So block grants do that. They decrease their their um, influence over the states. And then these grants come with federal mandates. And what a mandate is, a federal mandate is, is that it's, it's the national government basically saying to the state that you're getting this money, in order to get that money, you must follow our our conditions or you must go along with what we um, you must do something in order to get that money receiving the grant and a good example of this is a couple years ago probably like more like 10 years ago maybe by now um, the federal government had a mandate passed a mandate in Congress that in order to receive federal grants to help pay for roads um, states had to lower their blood alcohol content to in order to go to um, in order to be considered a DUI from point, uh, 0.10 to point zero 0.08. And if they didn't lower their blood alcohol content um, level to point zero 0.08, then they would not receive federal money to help pay for roads. And um, Nevada was one of those states that had to change their laws in order to receive that money, and Nevada did. You know, today, um, in order to be considered a um, driving under influence, you must have, be at a point zero eight or lower, and um, you can be locked away or put, go to jail for that. So federal mandate is basically money given to you with strings attached, and um, yeah, the states prefer uh, block grants more than categorical or or, with, or even kind of they don't even want to have any mandates or strings attached to it. So that's one way the national government can influence, heavily influence state governments. Um, and then issues with federalism in today's society, in today's world. Um, one of those issues is poverty. So back in 1996, the Republicans took control of both House and the Senate. They had the, the uh, majority in both houses. And this is the whole contract of America. And one of those um, uh, policies they wanted to pass was you know changing giving the states more power and in so doing so they they allowed the states to manage to manage their own welfare system rather than the national government when the new deal was passed the federal government was the one who man who managed the welfare system in America um, but after 1996 that reversed the world reversed and now the states are the ones managing that and since 1996 reforms the number of people on welfare in the United States has decreased um, some people think this is um, because of flexibility and creativity that the states have because they are able to manage their own money. Um, some others think that the de decrease is only because a strong economy, well, this is, you know, back in the day, strong economy, um, and they question whether the states will be able to continue to meet the needs of the poor if the economy goes bad, which it did. So that's the issue now today is can the states still provide an adequate quality of service to these people when they're not making as much money as they're used to. Second issue here um, today's in today's federal second issue with federalism today is homeland security, which after 9/11 was created to help uh, protect us from terrorism. It also um, is there in case of natural disaster. FEMA is under homeland security and they take care of natural disaster or, or other emergencies. And um, what happens with homeland security? Whenever um, a natural disaster takes place, for instance, they're going to work alongside the state and local governments. The problem with this is sometimes there's too many chefs in the kitchen having federal, state, and local governments all trying to work together. And because of that, they don't necessarily work well with each other. And there's, there's, not, there's a lot of miscommunication and um, misunderstanding of who's in charge and who's supposed to do what. And this is um, really evident in the Katrina hurricane in Louisiana, um, part of the reason, a major reason people were not getting the services provided to them quickly was because of this um, federalism of national and state governments trying to work together and they weren't able to work together basically to provide the needed services adequately quickly enough to these people who are suffering. So when federalism, when you have all levels of government trying to work together, it doesn't necessarily always mesh very well. Uh, the third issue with federalism today is an environment. Um, when it comes to environment, the national government is usually the one who is uh, responsible for making sure that the environment is being protected. Um, so 
I guess the issue is that some people believe that it could be better handled by at the state and local level. And some states do take it into their own hands. California is notoriously known. I don't know if notoriously known, but they're well known for um, being ahead of the curve when it comes to protecting the environment. Um, so some people think the state should be have more say into that instead of the, the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency having a lot taking care of a lot of the responsibilities. The fourth one is immigration. Um, if you look at the Constitution, one of the powers that's granted to Congress is um, handling immigration policies. And usually that just means, like, what does it mean to be a citizenship? How, how do you become a citizenship? And they also are making sure that taking care of the borders itself. I guess the, the issue is states that have international borders, like California, Arizona, Texas, uh, New Mexico, um, being on the on these borders on a, another country, they have uh, they have they have to take on a lot more responsibility than just citizenship and border protection, um, like education, health care, and social services. These are all different issues or responsibilities that they have to take on because of maybe the lack of the lack of responsibility that the national government is taking care of, um, not doing. And this is part of the reason why Arizona passed these immigration laws in their own state because they felt like the national government wasn't doing their part and so they needed to um, have tougher laws in their own state to prevent education and health care and social services going bankrupt in their own state. So that's the issue with immigration and the last one here at health care, um, Americans are kind of split on this and who should take care of this, the rising cost of health care uh, majority of Americans, not by much, you know, think that the, the, the new health care law that got passed isn't the best. Um, it's not maybe maybe the federal government's not responsible. That's not the responsibility. So it's pretty split. It's not a huge majority that are against it, but um, people are concerned with how much it costs, and so determining uh, who should take responsibility of this, national government or state and local governments. That's still a debate, and it's going to eventually make its way to the Supreme Court. And again, remember, the Supreme Court is a referee in determining who has more power or sway in these different issues, and health care is going to be definitely one of those once the Supreme Court um, has a case. Here's the case on the on the, the new health care law that was passed recently. So, again, to re reiterate, the essential question from this section is how is the balance of power between the states and national government characterized today? Um, you should be able to answer that question now based on um, this section. And that is it for Chapter 4.